All right, we don't want... Well, let's raise our Bibles. Repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it... Here, we'll say it together. I have what it says I have. I will do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert and my heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. And I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. Never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, you know that Proverbs 13.22, put that up. Uh, this has nothing to do with my sermon. Uh, but I want us to start putting a, a thing that will be up there while you're walking in. But I didn't give it to him in time because I usually was late, you know. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And the wealth of the... Si These are two things. I want you to see this. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And I think in the Amplified Classic, it says a little bit different. A good man leaves an inheritance of moral stability. Because I'm going to be talking about walking the way that God wants us to walk today. A good man leaves an inheritance of moral stability and goodness to his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner finds its way eventually into the hands of the righteous for whom it was laid up. You know, I had a guy tell me one time, boy, when these faith preachers say the wealth of, uh, of the sinner is laid up for the righteous, man, uh, uh, I don't think that's true. Well, you may not think it's true, but the Bible says it's true. When you hear somebody say, uh, I believe we need to have a transference from the wicked to the righteous, I go along with that completely. Or do you already have so much wealth that you don't need anything else? No, I ain't there yet. At any rate, so anyway, I don't want to share that before we get started. When people put down things like faith and things that we live by, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. I'm saved by faith. I live by faith. I walk by faith. Everything I do is by faith. I do it because I believe what God says, and I believe what God says is true, and it's true all the time. Amen. So at any rate, uh, we're going to start out in 1 Kings. We're going to have Old Testament and New Testament today. Uh, you ever had somebody say, I don't like that Old Testament. Well, that's too bad. It's, it's part of the Bible. <laughs> so, you know, uh, if you're not reading the Old Testament, you're not going to understand why God did what he did in the New Testament. Right. If you're not reading the New Testament, you don't understand why God did that in the New Testament if you haven't read the Old Testament. Amen. So we're going to talk about Rehoboam today. Uh, uh, Rehoboam was the son of Solomon. And he, uh, uh, you, he, had, he, he was the king over the south, the Judah. But I want to tell you this, and Jeroboam was the, the king of the north uh, when, when Israel was divided. But I want you to see this right here. Meanwhile, in the 21st verse of 1 Kings uh, 14, uh, Rehoboam, son of Solomon, was king in Judah. He was 41 years old when he became king. And he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. This, this is in the New Living. That's what we got, right? Uh, he reigned, uh, uh, where, where am I? 17 years in Jerusalem, the city of the Lord. Guess what? Did you know Jerusalem is still the city of the Lord? I was very glad when they brought the embassy back to, to Jerusalem. Uh, from all the tribes of Israel, there's a place to honor his name. Rehoboam's mother was Naamah, an Ammonite woman. During Rehoboam's reign, the people of Judah did what was evil in the Lord's sight. Now, it's amazing to me that he could have been provided everything he needed. Now, understand this. In another place, it talks about how Rehoboam had done this. At one time, the people got a hold of him. I think this is in, in the 12th chapter. I'm not really sure. But anyway, uh, Rehoboam had been complained about from the people. They said, man, what you do, you're, you're, you're putting too hard... Hard things on us. You're, you're too much taxes and everything. It's too hard for us. And so we want you to, to lighten the load. The burden on us is too heavy. So the first thing he did was he went to Solomon's the same. He had, this, he had the wisdom of Solomon in the leaders that were around him. So he went to them and said, what do you think we should do? And they said, well, lighten the load. 
If the people are hurting, lighten the load. So uh, uh, this is no statement about argument. But anyway, so uh, <laughs> so then he went to the young people that were around him. He said, do you think I ought to lighten the load? No, make it heavier. I want to tell you something. Do you know what you need to do? You need to listen for the great wisdom that's around you, but listen to wisdom that's actually wisdom. Somebody, sometimes people want to throw out there's, there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. There's only wisdom in a multitude of counselors that know the Lord or are following him. There's all the kinds of people give you advice, but none of that advice is so good, you know. You need to listen to what God wants you to be in your life. So anyway, during the reign the of people did what was even a sign, arousing his anger with their sin, and it was even worse than their ancestors. They built pagan shrines and set up as sacred pillars and Asherah poles. Uh, Asherah poles. Asherah was a, a goddess, a pagan goddess. Uh, and so on every hill and under every great tree, there were even shrine prostitutes throughout the land. The people initiated the uh, detestable practices. Can I read any more? I am really stumbling around. Uh, detestable practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven from the land the head of the Israelites. In the fifth year of Rehoboam's reign, the king Shishak of Egypt came up and attacked Jerusalem. He ransacked the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and stole everything, including the gold shields, which we find in another scripture. There were 300 gold shields. Gold shields, uh, Solomon, uh, Solomon, he entrusted them to the care of the... No. Afterwards, Rehoboam made bronze shields as substitute. This is what I want you to see. Here's the thing. Uh, I want you to see some things that have happened in the church today that line up with what Rehoboam did. Uh, what we've done is we've decided, a lot of churches today have decided that holiness doesn't really matter because we want to be able to accept what this world is doing. The church is not, accept, is not supposed to accept what the world is doing. The church is not supposed to say yes to every sin that the world commits. Uh, we're, we're in the business now. It seems like a lot of people want you to go, well, it's okay. They don't matter. They have that, it's your thing, it's your thing. Do what you want to do. That's not Christian behavior. Amen? Because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean we need to do it. We still believe in holiness. I'm not going to sing that whole song, but just remember, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, has he changed? He's not changed. Still a holy God. He is a holy God. And if we are going to live as an example to the rest of the world, we need to walk in holiness too. Did you know that it is not your holiness that's going to get you to heaven? It's the righteousness of Christ that was applied to you. Once you know that God has forgiven all sin, has acquitted you of all sin, shouldn't that make you want to live for him? Amen? But if you look at today, society today, they want us to accept everything that they're doing and say it's okay. That's why it's, people think that I'm being schizophrenic when I say I want every, 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 every kind of sinner to come inside this church. Why? Because I want them to remain sinning? No. Because I want them to get saved so they have the power of God on their side to change. Amen? How many people are glad that God pulled you out of all that stuff that you did way back in? And we want to help other people that same way. You know, we couldn't help them if we told them what they wanted to hear, but we can help them if we can tell them what the Word of God says. And as we live that example, you know, I had a guy come up to me one time. He said, I, I hear that you go to the bars. I said, when God calls me to go to the bar, I go to the bar. And he goes, so do you drink? No, he doesn't call me in there to go drink. Amen? I remember for about a year, was it about a year? I don't know who was with me then, but did we, for about a year we were, we'd get done with this service, and then at 1.30 down at Knucklehead Saloon, we'd do a service down at Knucklehead Saloon. And I remember Christians come up, well, they're not drinking, are they? It's a bar. <laughs> I didn't ask them to quit drinking because we were going to 
minister to them. So we do some great songs and Christian blues and, and regular Christian songs. We do that. And then I'd preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we saw people saved. Why? I'm not there to act like they are. I'm there to act the way I should so I can be an example to them. Amen? So holiness matters. Here, Rehoboam, he gives us an example of the way we are today. People told me one time, said things were completely different when, the, when, when Christianity started. No, it wasn't completely different. Christianity had the same problems then as they do now. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, there was a ruling religion there, a couple of different ruling religions. You had what they saw, uh, what the Greeks had, they, they worshipped idols. Then you had the Jews that were persecuting Christians when Christianity came about. And then you also had the Roman government that was a persecutor. We have the same thing going on today. So if we were to decide that what we're going to do is going to, we're going to just, we, we really, mm, you need to come to our church because everything's cool at our church and you'll be comfortable all the time. You're not going to be comfortable all the time if I'm preaching. You're not going to be comfortable all the time if Silas is preaching. Amen? Why? Because we're going to preach the Word. And the Word was not designed to make you comfortable. It was to tell you how you can walk in holiness. Amen? All right. So what did we see? What, what, what kind of things did... What kind of things did Rehoboam do? First of all, he failed to treasure what he had. He had this brain trust around him that had been around Solomon that could lead him in the right direction, doing the things that he ought to do. He had that group around him, and yet he didn't want to listen to them. He wanted to do whatever would profit him, but not profit the kingdom. And I want to tell you, even in this church right here, Somebody said, are you trying to build a great church? I said, if you're talking about how many come to the church, that's not what we're about. If I had to give up preaching the real word so that we could have 10,000 people in our church, I would not do it. Amen? So he failed to treasure what God had provided him. He provided him everything it took for him to be a successful king. But what did he do? He turned it back on God. The second thing, he abandoned the law of God. He abandoned the law. It got to the place where it didn't matter to him anymore what God wanted. He was going to do what people were telling him to do. Why? Well, there were still a lot of pagan people around him. And, and what did they do? They started getting involved with pagan practices. And as king, he should have shut it down. Moses would have shut it down. He might have shut it down the way that everyone was going to with it was swallowed up by the ground, you know what I'm saying? But he wouldn't say, no, it's okay. It don't matter what you do. It matters what you do because you're not the only person on this planet. And I want to tell you, when I get to heaven, I want to turn around and see people that I managed to lead to Christ that are there with me. That's what I want to see. Amen. So, first of all, he, he failed to treasure what he had. And then he abandoned the law of God, the will of God. Started doing his own thing. And then he gave up the true worship of God. The true worship of God wasn't to set up Asherah poles and, and, and worship a pagan God. He gave up what God had given him. I'm going to tell you something. When King Shishak came in there. He came because God sent him to punish, to punish them for the way they rebelled against him. He came in there and took 300 gold shields. What was the response of Rehoboam? He had 300 bronze shields made. Now, there's a big difference between a gold shield and a bronze shield. And yet I want to tell you, sometimes in churches today, they have given up what God would call gold for something that's nothing, has no value to it at all. Amen? I know I've told this story a lot of times. I was in a bike rally in, uh, I think it was Union, Missouri, but I don't remember. But anyway, where it was, I was, went to a lot of them. But I remember when he was there, um, 
I had some guys there that had heard me sing blues before, both types, Christian blues and other blues. And they said, uh, you going to do a blues song this morning? No. And I got up and sang the old rugged cross. There wasn't anybody really standing in front of the, of the stage that day. When I started singing the old rugged cross, something touched the people and they started coming out of their tents. I think they remembered what grandpa and grandma taught them and what their parents taught them. And, and they showed up there. I want to tell you right now, we need to return. I don't mean to the old worship song, but what I'm trying to say is we need to return to a desire to serve God. And give people the truth. And you know what you'll find? The people in this world. When we, when we first got an okay from the, from the 1% clubs here to wear our patch, I told them, I said, this is a church, not a, not a, not a bike club. It's just a church. So you're liable to see some grandma with it sewn on her, on her jacket, but it doesn't make any difference. We're not a bike club. We're a church. And so I went through that, and he said, are you going to police your own people? Yes. We got people that are, that are acting the way they shouldn't. I said, we'll pull their patch. Really? Yeah. I would rather do it than have the club, like they did with God's journeyman many, many years ago, come to a bike show and pull all their patches. Because do you know why? Even the unbelievers expect us to act like believers. And when we don't, what do they call us? Hypocrites. And we're not going to be called hypocrites, are we? He gave up the true worship of God. He didn't cherish the same things that God cherished. I'm going to tell you, it's not the circumstances that make us who we are. It's the decisions we make. We have the right and the responsibility to make right decisions about our life. The Bible tells us in, in, in John 14 and 16 that the Holy Spirit is our teacher. If you're a believer in here today, you have the Holy Spirit. You may have not received what people call the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit that guides you. He is your teacher. You have the Word and the Spirit teaching you. So you can never say, well, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do that. Yeah, you did. You just decided he's going to do it anyway. When he took those 300 gold shields, Rehoboam brought in shields that had no real value at all. I want the churches to rise up and quit thinking about how big their church can be. You know why they think that? Don't get mad at me when I say this. You know why churches want to have a lot of people? So they can build up their tithe. That's the wrong motivation. It's more important for us to build the kingdom of God than it is to build the size of our church. Amen? Amen. I got some questions for you. Do we treasure what God's given us? We need to treasure what God's given us. Look around you right now. The people that are in this room, they're treasure. I see you as a treasure. And I care about what happens to you. And God cares about what happens to you. And we care for each other. You know why? The Bible is very clear that if we're part of the family of God, we're part of a family that has people that are already in heaven and people all over this earth that know Christ. And when one of them hurts, we ought to hurt. Have we abandoned the word? Have we decided that I have a lot of things I need to do? You know, I would read the word this morning, but Lord, I've got an appointment to get my oil changed in my truck. Well, then read the word with you while you're getting your oil changed in your truck. I mean, put God's word right up there so you'll know this is, is an instruction to me, and I need to know what it says. Amen? We've got to set our hearts on seeking him. Set our hearts. It's a decision you're going to make. Amen? Let's turn to Ephesians 1. I said we'd do the Old Testament and New Testament, didn't I? 
I didn't mean I was going to start in Genesis and teach through Revelation. That would take a long, long time. And we would always be hungry long before that ever happened. So. In Ephesians 1, starting in the third verse, how we praise God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. You need to say that. When you find things that are positive in the Word of God, like what we, what we read a while ago, even in Proverbs, when you see something, then say it and apply it to yourself. Say, God, thank you for blessing me with every spiritual blessing. Remember in Colossians, it says you are complete in Him. Amen? Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we belong to Christ. Say, I belong to Christ. Long ago, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault. Think about that. That's the way you are in his eyes. Holy and without fault. Now, I get flack for this. When you come and cry out in God and you go, Oh, my God, I, look how I acted. I know I've been such a disappointment. No, you're holy and faultless in his sight. Jesus did that work. It's the reason the Bible said, if your heart, listen to this, if your heart condemn you not, you have peace with God. If your heart condemn you not, well, God's not condemning you. Why? Because he did the very worst, the hardest thing he had to do. He killed his own son as a sacrifice so that you and I could have eternal life. Amen? We ought to be glad about that. That ought to put a happy dance in us. Amen? He loved us. And he chose us. And he did that before even creating this world. He knew before he said, let there, uh, uh, let, let there be light, he knew that you were going to exist. You. Well, how could an all-knowing God know about all these billions? of billions? How? He's God. I'm still trying to remember where I put my Bible and keys most of the time. But God doesn't have that problem. So before he ever, ever created this world, he chose that you would exist and that you would be holy and unblameable in his eyes. <sighs> Are anybody glad about that? His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us in his own family. By bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ, and this gave him great pleasure. Have you ever felt like God is greatly disappointed in you? Well, he's not. You've never done anything that surprised him. There's never time that God the Father turns to God the Son and says, Son, can you believe he did that? They knew it all ahead of time. We are not the miserable creatures that somebody, some people try to make you feel. That's not us. Amen? And when you get that down deep in your heart, you'll quit condemning yourself for everything, and you'll look at yourself. What's the Bible tells us to do in Romans? That we're to judge ourselves soberly and righteously. We're to look at ourselves. We're supposed to see us. Not to think too highly of ourselves, but through grace and faith, understand who God created us to be. And I want to tell you something. Your life will change. So we praise God for the wonderful kindness he's poured out on us because we belong to his dearly loved son. He's so rich in kindness that he purchased our freedom. Say, it's a done deal. He purchased my freedom. Huh. Man. Mm. Through the blood of his son. And our sins are forgiven. Say, my sins are forgiven. This is why you need this word. Start feeling bad. If you all you did was read this chapter, you'd go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I forgot. Sins are forgiven. He showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. Turn to your neighbor and say, I may not look like it, but I got all wisdom and understanding. And if your wife's looking back at you laughing, you know, I'm a, 
God's secret plan has now been revealed to us. That, that word, you've heard me say it before in the Greek, was the word mysterion. It means that there was a secret thing that none of the Old Testament saints were allowed to know that it was revealed in this last day. Mysterion means it's a mystery that's not, not been made plain till now. So, he, so he, God. God's secret plan has now been revealed to us. It's a plan centered on Christ. Did you know everything in this Bible is about Jesus? Designed long ago, uh, ago, according to his good pleasure, and this is his plan. At the right time, he will bring, who will bring it? God will bring it. He will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because of the, furthermore, I'm having trouble seeing this morning for some reason. Furthermore, because of Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. Say, I have an inheritance from God. Amen. For he chose us from the beginning, and all things happen just as he did. What should I say? All things happen how? Just as he said. Just. He chose us in advance. This is a plan. At the right time, he'll bring everything together under the authority. Everything in heaven and earth. We're united with Christ. We received an inheritance from God. He chose us in advance. And he makes everything work out according to his plan. Now, I know that's tough for some of us. We're his children. He's well pleased with us. We've been set and we've been made righteous. But you know, some of you still want him to do everything according to your plan. Well, it don't always work that way, does it? Let me tell you the truth. I, I wanted to get saved when I saw the faith and the love of Brother Joe Nicholson the missionary that led me to the Lord so many years ago. I wanted to get saved. Do you think there was anything in me that wanted to preach? No. But when I got saved, I developed such a hunger for the Word, I, I just had to read it through every month, 40 chapters a day. And so I read it through. Man, that got me more excited than ever. The more I read it, the more I liked it. Now, some people would read the Bible when they first got saved, and because of bad training when they grew up, they see everything negative in the Bible. You're looking at a man saw everything positive. <laughs> Amen. He covered us with kindness. He gave us the Holy Spirit, which is the proof that we belong to Christ. And in the midst of troubles, I want to tell you, you need to go back this and consider Jesus. Consider Jesus. In the midst of everything that you're going through, start, start thinking about Jesus. Start thinking, dwelling on him. Oh, my, my car's not running right. Yeah, but I belong to Jesus. Oh, man, my bills aren't getting paid. Yeah, but I belong to Jesus. Well, my wife's mad at me. You probably deserve it. Anyway... <laughs> Consider you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, I'm getting myself in trouble. God's purpose was that we were first to trust in Christ. We who first trust in Christ should praise our glorious God. And now you've heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own. Now, he did what? He identified you as his own. You know what he did not say? He knew that you'd always act like you were his own. No. It's one of the reasons that when people read 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, they, they always want to talk about these are the people that will not inherit the kingdom of God. But they don't go to the next verse. And such were some of you, but you have been cleansed and washed. Your identity, I saw something, there's, there's a great guy, I studied a lot of his stuff, he don't believe the same way I do, but that's okay, he was still quite a scholar, finest day, can anybody know finest day? And uh, I have his Bible, but I didn't agree with a lot of what he said, he just was really good at making lists and all that kind of stuff. 
But he said, uh, don't ever believe for a moment that God changed your identity. And when I read that, I thought, I'll throw this Bible away. If he didn't change my identity, then I'm still a sinner. He was a great guy that understood healing, but he didn't understand a thing about the grace of Christ. And I want to tell you something. The grace of Christ is the only reason that he's the healer or anything else inside my life. Amen? Amen. So when I think about that, I think, I don't have the same identity. Can I tell you this? If you were a drunk, when you got saved, you're no longer, you may still be acting like that, but can I tell you something? When you're a drunk, God no longer sees you a drunk. He sees you as a saint. Everything in that list that you see, God sees you as a saint. You're a sanctified one. You've been set apart for his work, no matter what struggles you may be having in life. You know, that's the reason I talk about when it comes to our behavior. Remember, we are body, soul, and spirit, right? Or the really way to say it is spirit, soul, and body. My spirit was made of the very seed of God. It sins not. It does not sin. Impossible for me to sin with my spirit. But my mind, will, and emotions make up my soul. I can sin with my mind, will, and emotions. You know, because some of you right now say, I wish that guy'd shut up so I'd go eat. A great sin in the eyes of God. Anyway, so the thing about it is, is that uh, you can sin with your thought life and you can sin with your body. You can't sin with your spirit. That's the reason I'm glad that I was counted righteous and identified as righteous. So even when I'm stupid, God doesn't change his opinion about me. People are not that way. Oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. I had one gal that went to church years ago. I was so tired, I should have went, shouldn't have went to go see her when I was so tired. And uh, I, I paid a bill at the place where she worked. And she goes, I don't know why you don't care about the loss. Well, I'm a very evangelistic person. So I said, what do you mean I don't care about the loss? Well, she started off ranting and raving. I said, do you know how many people I lead to the Lord? I care about the loss. And every service we have an opportunity for people to say yes to Christ. I care about the loss. And she, and she goes, you look like you're upset about that. And I said, what if people just told you about yourself? Oh, I should never have said that. God didn't call me to say that. That was me in my flesh. Well, what do you mean? What have I ever done wrong? Where everything you've ever started in the church, you've quit. We can't count on you for anything. Do you think God sponsored those words? No, it was mean and cruel. So when I tried to apologize to her, man, she just wouldn't let me apologize to her. She ended up quitting the church. I did everything I could to try to restore with her, but I couldn't. But here's the thing. What I did in the flesh didn't affect my salvation because my flesh is not saved. When I die, my soul and spirit will go up to be with the Lord. Amen? You know where my body will go? Into the dirt. Until the resurrection. Then it'll come up looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> the young Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Did you ever see that movie Space Cowboys? And here's this old man there. It made me feel good because I have the boobs of a young woman. <laughs> and so them guys were standing there with no shirt on. I'm looking at, hey, they got the same boobs I do. And so it made me feel better. So anyway, you won't hear that in everybody that preaches the gospel. In the, the second chapter, I'm going to read you a few things and we'll, we'll close this out. I have one more verse to go to. Uh, he says in the second chapter of Ephesians, he says, you were once dead, doomed forever because of your many sins. You used to live just like the rest of the world. What did you do? You used to live just like, is there an expectation of change? You used to live just like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince of the power of the air. He's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And all of us used to live that way, following the passions, the desires of our evil nature. We were born with an evil nature, and we were under God's anger just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so very much. 
here's the key. He loved you while you were still in that state. He didn't wait for you to get right in your head and everywhere else before he loved you. He loved you while you were yet sinners. It says that, it says that in Romans 5, too. While we were yet sin, sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. We have one more scripture. Let's turn to John 3. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, came to speak with Jesus. Teacher, he said, We all know that God sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are proof enough that God is with you. Jesus replied to you, I assure you, unless you're born again, you can never see the kingdom of God. Is that pretty plain? Well, what do you mean? exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back in the mother's womb and be born again? Well, thank God that's not the way for salvation. Jesus replied, the truth is no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives us new life from heaven. So don't be surprised at my statement that you must be born again. Just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. What do you mean, Nicodemus said? Jesus replied, you're a respected Jewish teacher. And you don't understand these things? I assure you, I'm telling you, what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe. But if you won't even believe when I'm talking to you about things that happen on earth, how can you possibly believe if I tell you what's going on in heaven? For only I, the Son of Man, have come to earth and will return to heaven again. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on the pole in the wilderness, so I, the Son of Man, must be lifted up on a pole. So that, what was he talking about? The cross. So that everyone who believes in me will have eternal life. How many people? Everyone who believes. God so loved the world, he gave his only sons, that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have ever, <laughs> eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. There is no judgment waiting, awaiting those who trust him. Stop right there. How many times have you heard in your life people pounding a pulpit that you're going to be judged for everything, judged for everything? No, not me. I'm a believer. When I'm raptured out of here, I'll stood, stop at the judgment seat of Christ, which is not the great white throne judgment. And there I'll receive the reward. The word is bema. The Greek word bema. The reward seat. That's what it was called when they would have the Olympic type games and stuff way, way back then. You went there to get your reward. That's the only judgment we'll get. We'll be good judged for what we did here on earth for the Lord. The Bible says another, in another place, that the things I did for the Lord are going to be like precious gold and silver. And the things that I did for me are going to be like wood, hay, and stubble. And that's going to be burned up. I'm hoping I don't have too big a bonfire up there. <laughs> <laughs> but those who do not trust him have already been judged for not believing the only Son of God. Their judgment is based on this fact. The light came from heaven to the world. They love the darkness more than light. Uh, for their actions were evil. They hate the light because they want to sin in the darkness. They stay away from the light for fear of their sins will be exposed and they'll be punished. But those who do what is right come to the light gladly so everyone can see uh, that they are doing what God wants. Listen to me. We're in a strange place right now where we're going to be even going to the polls and I'm tired of people telling me that my religion shouldn't get be there when I go in. I don't have religion. I have Christ. When I go into that voting booth, I'm going to vote not for the character of the person, but for the issues that they're doing. How are they going to affect us? We're trying to lead people to Christ, so I'm not going to vote for someone that's going to lead us into more darkness. I had a guy send me a notice. He said, well, listen, you know, Trump is this and Trump is that and Kamala is this and that. Now, listen. I said, don't talk about what they've done. King David, he was an adulterer and a murderer. God even called him, he said, David, you're a bloody man. And yet he set him in a high position and exalted him. I'm not judging character when I go into the polls, when I go in there to, to put a ballot. I'm judging what are the, how are the issues going to affect this world because I'm out to lead this world to Christ and I'm not voting for anybody that has anything 
inside of their ideas that's going to be contrary to what the word wants. Amen. Aren't you glad that's all I said about that? I had somebody say, well, what are you going to do if you vote for Trump and, and, but Kamala wins? I said, you may not believe this, but I will pray for her because the Bible says for me to pray for those in leadership. Once it's done, it's done. And we're going to pray because the Bible says if we pray for those leaders so that we might live peaceably. Amen? I'll do my part. God will do his part. How about that? I want to tell you something. I said all this I said today for a reason. You look at the example of Rehoboam, who had everything that should have made him very successful as a king, but he chose to rebel against God. He chose. He didn't make that decision that said, no matter what the young people around me say, I'm going to do what's right. No matter what this world does, they may want to serve pagan, but by golly, I am going to serve God. And that's a decision we all have to make every day. Amen? And don't let anything get in the way of that. Choose to serve God, to love God. And did you know every sinner that you know, that you may judge so severely, can I tell you this? Jesus died for them. So your not job isn't to condemn them, but to love them and bring them into the kingdom. Does that make sense? You believe that? All right, I love you more than peanut butter. You know that, don't you? <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's stand to our feet. You will have, you have an opportunity every time we have a service. I didn't ask you what you did when you were 10 years old. I went forward when I was 10 years old. So did I because I wanted to play baseball. My friend played baseball for Draper Lake Baptist Church outside Oklahoma City. I said, I want to play baseball. He got a member of the church. I said, I'll be a member of the church. How do you do that? Go forward when the altar call happens. So I went there, and, that, and old Brother Thompson went like this and said, I can't believe I remembered his name. Brother Thompson goes like this. Well, what do you need, young man? I said, I want to play baseball. <laughs> he said, well, you have to be a member of the church to play. And, okay, I want to be a member of this church. Well, do you know Jesus? And I said, I want to play baseball. He said, will you say a prayer with me? I said that prayer. I didn't get saved then because all of my motivations were wrong. But I got saved when I was 29 years old. And I bet everybody that ever spoke a word to me about Christ from the very beginning of my life fed into my getting saved when old brother Joe Nicholson talked to me. What do you think? We're planting seeds out there. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. We're going to say a sinner's prayer together right now. I'm not trying to get you to go to the place where you say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do everything right. Well, you just lied right then. But you know the one who did everything right in our place, don't you? Amen. Let's just raise our hand. Say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly thank you for sending Jesus. You sacrificed your own son so that I might have eternal life. He paid for my sin already. I don't pay for it. He did. And you asked me to do one thing. Receive Jesus as my Savior. As a matter of my will, I say, Lord Jesus, take control. Move into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. My life is yours. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In your precious name, amen. Hallelujah. Our ushers are going to. Our ushers are going to. We're going to take communion together. I'm so glad I get to pastor such a great bunch of people. Every now and then when I say I love you more than peanut butter, they say, do you love peanut butter? Yes, I wouldn't use that if I didn't. <laughs> do you like Reese's? 
My wife loves Reese's. I don't like Reese's, but Debbie loves Reese's. I like a spoon and a peanut butter jar. <laughs> Thank you. If, if you're visiting today, take communion with us, man. Are you taking communion with us? Oh, good. What, are we going to have another win with the Chiefs today? Yeah. Go Chiefs. Well, all righty then, let's lift the bread. Say it with me. Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. It is for my healing, my spouse's healing, my children's healing. Thank you that by your stripes, by the beatings you bore, by the lashes which fell on your back, we are completely healed. I believe that I receive. Raise the cup. Thank you, Jesus, for the new covenant cut in your blood. Your blood has brought me forgiveness, washed me from every sin. I thank you that your blood has made me righteous. And as I drink, I celebrate and partake of the inheritance of the righteous, which is preservation, healing, wholeness, and prosperity. Thank you, Jesus.
Make sure you tell somebody how much you love them before you leave here today. Spread that love of Jesus. Thank you. Love you too. Well, you know the drill. The Bible says in James 3, with this tongue, we often bless God, but we curse man who was made in God's image. And he says, my brethren, it ought not be so. Let's just speak a blessing right now. Father, I speak a blessing on everyone here, business, home, social, physical, mental, and spiritual. Pour out your love, your power, your grace, your spirit in such a mighty way that when the rest of the world sees them, they'll say, surely these people have been with Jesus. Have a wonderful afternoon. Go Chiefs.